All right, peace family. It's none other than your brother, Professor Ace, AfricanCreationEnergy.com. Today is February 28th, 2022. Um, so I wanted to, to do this video before the end of Black History Month. So um, this was actually a request. Um, somebody hit me up. They sent me a series of links um, to a debate where people were debating whether or not you should make uh, parallels between modern scientific concepts and African uh, mythologies and cosmologies and philosophies, right? So um, I watched parts of the video just to get an idea of what the argument was. And I just wanted to offer this as a, um, as just a perspective, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, so just recently did a video about the, my, my nine tips for uh, black students in STEM. If I were to give a number 10 tip, it would be um, don't sell back your books, especially not your major books, um, the books related to your major. The information in the books is more valuable uh, than that little money they're going to give you back when you sell your books back. So this is my uh, physics book from undergrad, Physics for Science and Engineers. Right? And the reason why I'm pulling this out is because I want to show that the reason why it's valid to make parallels between African cosmologies, mythologies, and philosophies to scientific principles is because the precedent has already been set in STEM education, right? So let's check out this book. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. And it, you don't you don't have to even get far far into the into the study before they start doing it. Right? All right, so this is chapter one. So, you know, imagine you're a student before you even get into anything about the actual topic you're being taught, you're introduced to the philosophies and mythologies of the Greeks. So this is page one, chapter one, page one, mechanics. So we come down here to um, one, two, three, for the, four, the fourth paragraph, the first serious attempts to develop a theory of motion were provided by the Greek astronomers and philosophers. So right away, before we get into anything uh, relevant to the actual modern scientific concepts in physics that we're supposed to be learning in this course, they tell you that the first serious attempts were done by Greek philosophers. So again, if the connection can be made to Greek philosophies, to modern science concepts, why can it not then be made from African philosophies to modern science concepts, especially if those African philosophies influence the Greeks? All right, uh, let's go to another book. This is my uh, modern physics. This deals with the theory of relativity, uh, time dilation, length contraction, everything coming out of modern physics related to um, the theory of relativity, right? Again, you get to chapter one. We don't even get deep. Page one, chapter one. Let's read this first sentence. The earliest recorded systematic efforts to assemble knowledge about motion as a key to understanding natural phenomena were those of the ancient Greeks. Set forth in sophisticated form by Aristotle's, theirs was a natural philosophy of explanations deduced from assumptions rather than from experimentation. A, a philosophy of explanations deduced from assumptions rather than exper experimentation. So again, if a philosophy of explanation deduced by assumptions qualifies as being discussed in the history and the development of scientific concepts from the Greeks, why then doesn't the same thing apply to African philosophies or in really any other culture, right? You don't, we, <laughs> the reason why people feel like science is the white man's science is because when we study the history of scientific concepts, we find instances like this, where even at this point, when we're in ancient times and science was ex expressed through philosophy that was only based on assumptions and not experimentations when you can even find examples of that in other cultures and African cultures those cultures are not discussed 
That is the purpose of ethnoscience. Again, um, if you're in the Atlanta area, go to Georgia State University College of Education, Dr. Iman. She's the one who introduced me to the term ethnomathematics and ethnoscience, right? Um, and so those are the physics books. I sold back um, my other books. I had an intro to aeronautics, had an intro to robotics and computer science. Uh, in, in my intro to robotics course, they had discussions about, um, what was that, that uh, Talos, which was a, um, a statue that the, the Greek uh, craftsman um, Hephaestus created and how that is somehow evidence of um, a conceptualization of robotics, right? So there is a plethora of examples of scientific concepts being related to philosophies and mythologies from the Greeks. And since that precedent has already been set in STEM education, um, that is why we can and should do the same thing with African philosophies and mythologies. Um, so that's why it's valid and why it's needed is because it's not only the Greeks, it's not only uh, relevant to the Greeks, right? Other cultures did that. So this is Helen Kopp, is a book that I wrote in 2014, uh, where I discuss this very I issue, right? So we're on page 23, chapter two. When the history of aviation or the history of, of pretty much any modern scientific concept for that matter is researched in the Western world, Often you find discussions from Greek and European mythology are included in the conversation. For example, most articles and textbooks which discuss the history of aviation will include the story about Icarus from the Greek mythology. In the mythological story, Icarus's father, Daedalus, builds Icarus a set of wings using bird's feathers as beeswax. Daedalus warns Icarus that when using the wings to fly, Icarus should not fly too close to the sun or else the beeswax would melt and Icarus would fall out of the sky. In the story, Icarus's e ego and pride causes him to want to see how high he can fly. So Icarus ignores his father's warning, flies too close to the sun, and the wax on the wings melts, and Icarus falls to his death. The story of Icarus is, is an obvious mythological allegory about the potential consequences of excessive pride and ambition. However, the mythological story is still included in the conversation about the history of aviation. Even more surprising, when the history of modern aeronautics is researched, discussions about inventions which did not actually work and fly, but were merely imagined to have worked by the inventor, are included in the conversation about the history of modern aeronautics. Case in point, the flying machines of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci's flying machines included drawings and sketches for a human-powered hand glider, a parachute, an aerial screw helicopter type of aircraft, and several plans for human-powered ornithopter, flapping wing devices, which he thought all would be capable of flight. However, there is no evidence that Leonardo ever built any of these flying machine devices that he drew. And many years later, when people did attempt to build the flying machines based on Leonardo's designs, none of the devices were capable of flight. They did not even lift off the ground. Leonardo da Vinci's flying machines did not fly. They were simply drawings which were merely representations of the concept of human power flight. However, the flying machines of Leonardo are still mentioned in the conversation about the history of aeronautics. So this was my last point. Since the precedent of including mythological, magical, symbolic, and representat representative concepts in the discussion of, of the historical origin of scientific principles and technological development has already been established, and in order to be balanced and fair, and not to be biased or, or to promote a double standard, then it is imperative that the appropriate associated concepts found in African and other non-European cultures be included in the discussion of the historical origin of the scientific principles and technological development. So that's it, man. You know, um, so why is it, why is it valid? Because the precedent has already been set in STEM education. Why is it necessary? Because it's not just the Greeks or U Europeans who um, express science through philosophies and mythology at their time. Again, science evolves just like technology evolves. If you can understand that um, there was a technological development from um, hand axes to spears to um, bow and arrows to rifles, right, to rockets. If you can understand that development, 
then it is an equal uh, progression, an equal development, an equal evolution that takes place from people expressing their understanding and knowledge about the natural world uh, in the form of philosophy and mythology to our modern scientific theories. Um, to belittle or demean someone's philosophy and mythology um, and their attempt to express their understanding of the natural world, their attempt to express science through that philosophy and mythology, to demean that would be like demeaning somebody's use of stone, um, handheld stone axes at that particular time, right? So that's it. Um, last thought, um, in those video links that you sent me, um, I, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but everybody on one side of the argument, everybody who was in favor of making those connections between African cosmologies and mythologies to science, everybody had a degree in one of the STEM fields, or most of the people had a degree in one of the STEM fields, right? And on the other side of the argument, the people who were against doing that, um, I think most of them did not, right? So there was a clear line, a clear uh, demarcation right there in terms of the background. The people who had background in STEM, um, they were in favor of making those arguments and that's because the precedent has already been set in STEM education. So you can say that um, they understood the assignment, right? Um, so that's it. Um, last thought, right? Um, first of all, the word pseudo, uh, when used in um, modern academia, it is a adjective, not a noun, right? Uh, number two, um, the, the demarcation criteria between pseudoscience and science is what they call falsifiability. That means being able to prove something wrong and making an attempt to prove something wrong. The way it shows up in practice and action is this. Um, when confronted with new ev evidence, new information, new data, and that new evidence, information, and data disproves a scientist's idea, the scientists will change their idea, right, in order to preserve the evidence, information, and data. When a pseudoscientist encounters new evidence, new information, new data, which disproves their idea, rather than changing their idea, rather than changing their mind, they'll make an attempt to change and deny the, the data, change and dismiss the data, right? So that's how it shows up in action, right? Um, please understand that allegories, metaphors, similes, um, parallels, None of those are pseudoscience. As a matter of fact, they are regularly and routinely used in science and STEM education and communication. All right, family, peace.